45. And the second talk of today uh, will be given by Fo Ling Zhou from Michigan University, and he will be telling us about uh, monoidal and symmetric monoidal structures. Thanks, Hannah, for the introduction. And thanks, everybody, for attending my talk. So I'm going to give two talks um, in the infinity category theme. I'm going to talk about monoidal structures. This is a roadmap of what I'm going to talk about in these two talks. So on top is the one category world. And there we have um, the notion of symmetric monoidal categories. And I'll also introduce a little bit what is an operat. And there is a common ground for these two kinds of objects called multi-categories and or colored operates. They mean the same thing. And um, from there, I will, I'm going to explain a construction that gives you a category over finite uh, thing star, which is the category of based finite sets and based morphisms. So we are going to follow this route to be able to understand um, symmetric monodal category and operates in a different language, which is here, categories over, over star, thing star. And then this perspective will help us to understand um, the corresponding notion in the infinity categorical ground, which is in the roadmap on the bottom. Um, we have notions of symmetric monoidal infinity categories and infinity operates with symmetric monoidal categories being special cases of infinity operates. As you can tell from how I place these two row maps, infinity operates generalizes multi-categories, not operates in the infinity category world. And I'm also going to tell, talk about um, algebras over operate and their modules in the infinity category world a little bit. Okay, so that's the summary and I'm going to start the talk. So let's start with some pre preliminary in infinity categories. In this talk, we are going to see the word co-cartesian a lot. And I'm not, um, I will not allow anybody to walk out, walk out of the talk not knowing what a co-cartesian edge means. Um, basically, we have a lot of notions of vibrations in infinity category um, or in simplicial sets. We have inner vibrations, co-cartesian vibrations, left vibrations, and con vibrations, for example, and the corresponding right version of them. And as I line the, them in this order, um, a con vibration is always a left vibration. So left vibration has less structure than a con vibration. And a co-cartesian vibration has less structure than a left vibration. Right, so how do we think of it? Well. Here, a vibration, when we study such a map from X to S in simplicial sets, well, we want it to be an inner vibration because that's, um, if such, then we have that the fibers over each vertex in S is an infinity category. Um, if P is an inner vibration. And if P is a co-cartesian vibration, then we get that if there is a morphism in S, then we can get on fibers, a covariant functor well-defined up to canonical equivalence. So the theme here is that we want to straighten this vibration into some functor out of S. And if P is a co-cartesian vibration, then we um, we have what F, uh, what this functor does on objects of S, and we also have what it does on uh, morphisms, roughly speaking, right? And if P is furthermore a left vibration, then it says that the fibers is not only an infinity category, but it's actually a con complex. And here, if it's a confibration, we um, here we can say much better because um, over a point, 
a cone vibration is the same thing as a left vibration. Okay, so the slogan here is that co-cartesian vibrations, um, roughly speaking, are equivalent to covariant functors from S to the infinity category of cat infinity categories. And duly, Cartesian vibrations are contravariant functors. And left and right vibrations are functors into cone complexes. Okay, so that's the slogan here for how to understand these kind of vibrations. Okay, so now I'm going to um, go back to the definition in one category of uh, what a symmetric monoidal category is. A symmetric monoidal category has the data, a category C, a tensor product like this, and a unit object um, with... Okay, yeah, but like... Um, yeah. With natural isomorphisms uh, called unitors, commutators, and associators telling us um, when we do this tensor product in different orders, or when we tensor with unit, um, we get isomorphisms to what it should be. But they are not equivalent, or they are not um, the same. They are not, well, that means that it's not identity, it's just a natural isomorphism. So these are some data. And there are coherent diagrams, including um, the well-known pentagon and hexagon diagrams, relating how these natural isomorphisms behave when you compose them a bunch of times. And you can find this in this reference, um, some definitions everybody should know. And well, examples include um, K vector spaces, tensor product of vector spaces, and the vector space of dimension one, and topological spaces, Cartesian product, and the one point topological space and spectra, smash product, and the sphere spectra. Okay, so that's a symmetric monoidal category. And now I'm going to talk about what is a multi-category. And then I'm going to um, construct out of a symmetric monoidal category, a multi-category. Okay, a multi-category has objects just like a category. Instead of morphisms, it has multimorphisms. So in an ordinary category, a morphism is just has an input X and an output Y. So in a multi-category, the input can be N objects with N greater or equal to zero, and the output is um, one object. And you have a set here for the multimorphism, and you can compose multimorphisms in a way that um, if you have these multimorphisms here, you will, uh, just like a tree, you can compose them to get a multimorphism from topmost to bottommost. And there's symmetric group action on the input. Okay, so what about examples? Well, the vector space example actually is a multi-category uh, as well. We can, for example, define multi-maps from V1, V2 to W with two inputs V1, VW being bilinear maps. And as we all know, bilinear maps is just the same thing as linear maps out of the tensor product. And this is basically the universal property of the how we define the tensor product. Right, so motivated by this example, um, you see that what we have done here is built from a symmetric monoidal category, a multi-category, namely starting with the symmetric monoidal category of vector spaces. We define the multi-category with multimorphisms being bilinear maps or multilinear maps in general. And this is a general construction. So we will usually write C tensor I for the input and the output we will write C tensor. Okay, so now from a multi-category, I'm going to build a single category. So I do not like multi-inputs and I want to 
think about the multi-input as a single object. Then I can get a new category, M tensor, and it's naturally over thing star. Well, its objects are uh, N tuples of objects from M with N greater or equal to zero, and these are objects. And its morphisms consist of the following data. So first, I need the map from the input set, the index of the input set to the index of the output set, with this zero being the base point and redundant zero cents to zero. Um, and then for this alpha, um, for each j from one to m, I need an element from the multimorphism of the pre-image of j to yj. OK. So this is a category. And this composition of multimorphisms will give me a composition in this category m tensor. And I said it's over thin star. What is thin star? Well, thin star is the category of finite base sets. And I write its elements like this. Bracket n means the base set 0, 1 to n, with 0 being the base point. And its morphisms are base maps. So just um, by projecting these morphisms to the alpha component, I will get a map from m tensor to thin star. Okay, why do we introduce the base point zero? Well, let me not get rid of this. Right, so the idea is that the map alpha with the zero is basically allowing us to forget elements in alpha, in, in N. Alpha N, N to M can forget Uh, by forget, I mean send them to zero in M. And it is important to forget points to be able to do this. Okay, so you can keep this sentence in your mind for a moment, and we will see this after we finish the talk. Okay, so now I'm going to proceed with this construction. I've constructed this functor out of a symmetric monoidal category. And can we recover the symmetric monoidal category out of it? Well, the answer is in this box. The symmetric monoidal category up to symmetric monoidal equivalences are equivalent to such functors satisfying two conditions, M1 and M2. Okay, let me give them a name. M1 is called the co Cartesian, con well, I call it the co Cartesian condition. And M2 is called the Siegel condition. Well, M2 is standard. M1 is just the name I'm calling it today. Okay, what is M1? Well, M1 says that P is an off vibration of categories. What this means is that for all alpha, for all alpha in here, in thin star, there exists an F in C tensor, F here, uh, such that for all C double prime, well, um, for alpha and and C, so C is fixed. Um, F and C prime is um, you can choose. Give me the color. Okay, such that for all double C prime. And the data G G beta um G is here, beta is here, satisfying condition that uh, P of G is the composite of beta and alpha. Um then there is unique a unique lift 
Well, let me just call it H. It's a lift of beta um, with, so P of H is beta and H composed with F is G. Okay, so if you follow my steps in drawing this diagram, you see that I'm actually filling a horn like this. So this is this condition um, is basically saying p uh, the the edge f is p co Cartesian, and I put it in quote because here I'm in categories instead of infinity categories, and if I generalize, if I take a nerve of this, then I'm exactly saying f is P co Cartesian. But in infinity categories, P co Cartesian edges um, allow you to have this um, unique up to a contractible choice. So that's basically what P co Cartesian means. Okay, so the content of this condition M1 is saying that for any alpha in fin star, in fin star um, I'm saying alpha admits a P co Cartesian lift. So I have a covariant functor on fibers. So D bracket N means fibers over, over N. And this is well defined up to canonical isomorphism. This is the content of what the condition one is saying. And we can verify this for the construction C tensor when we come from a symmetric monoidal category. In this case, our C tensor over N is just C to the N. And now I, I need to construct for you um, for such an alpha, what is alpha lower shriek? So alpha lower shriek is a map from C to the N to C to the N. And we can decompose alpha as uh, made up by projections um, in a form projections to a point or uh, injective maps. Okay, and for projections, it's basically uh, maps of this format and it picks out a coordinate. Um, Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm saying the wrong thing. It's the product, tensor product of all the x, um, because we are mapping all points to one. Okay, and for injections, um, this is the fiber over c to the zero, or uh, whatever is missing in c to the n. Um, we just take the unit in c. So this is what alpha lower shriek is given by if you um, look into what alpha does on coordinates. So here, what I have proved is that the C tensor I constructed out of a symmetric monoidal category over fin star satisfies M1. Right, so now I'm going to go to M2, the Siegel condition. The Siegel condition says that um, if we examine these kind of maps rho i, which sends i to one and other points to zero, then the induced map over the fiber n to the fiber of one n times by rho one shriek to rho n shriek is an equivalence. Let's verify this for C tensor um, from a symmetric monoidal category as well. And then you will see why we need this condition. Okay, so rho i lower shriek from C to the N to C just picks out XI in this case. So if we take, um, look at this map, what we get is actually an equality. Okay. So the content of M2 from this example um, is that 
we have this equivalence, the fiber over n is n times the fiber over one, um, but we are not asking it to be an equal thing, but we are just saying it's equivalent. And this equivalence is some data built in this um, built in this um, map over fin star. Okay, so now I've finished explaining these two conditions. And it turns out that they are all of them, uh, they are all you need to have so that D does come from some symmetric monodal category. So now I'm doing the other direction. Starting with a P satisfying M2, M1, what is the symmetric monodal category? Um, the category is the fiber over one. The unit is seen from this map, zero to one, this unique map. And the commutator, uh, sorry, the multiplication alpha, uh, the, the multiplication tensor comes from the map alpha that sends both one and two to one. So this um, gives you an alpha lower shriek here. And from condition, single condition, you have an equivalence. So composing with an inverse of it, you get a, a functor from C squared to C. And this is going to be the tensor. And um, the commutator, sorry, this should be two. The commutator, the unitor, and the associator all are given um, in this in the data here. And I'm not going to um, write out all the details. Okay, right. The summary here um, is that the classical definition of a symmetric monodal category has data C tensor I alpha beta gamma as natural transformations. And it puts the requirement that some diagram commute. And it's non-trivial work. McLean has a paper to limit these diagrams to some finite number. And there are, well, I want to say they are complicated, but I won't say this because um, maybe I'm just not knowing enough of it to see why they are apparent. Well, in this new perspective, however, we are able to simplify a little bit in, in the picture. We have just the data of a single map, and we have the condition M1, M2, and all these data here are packed both in this P and also in this condition. Okay, so that is a comparison of these two perspectives. And the advantage of new perspective, number one, it's, it's simpler, and number two is that it's easier to generalize to infinity categories. And basically, we are generalizing up vibration to P co Cartesian, uh, sorry, to co Cartesian vibration. That's the only thing we are doing. And as a remark, uh, I'm not going to talk about this in my talk, but if you have seen this topic before, in FinStar, there are two kinds of maps called active and inert. I'm going to talk about inert, but not active in my talk. And active is sort of the data side of, um, of the story, and inert morphisms are sort of the requirements side of the story. So you will see in my second talk that when I define maps, maps should preserve structures. So maps, we are going to require those to preserve inner things, which I haven't defined yet. Okay, right. So uh, this definition I have said in words in the summary, a symmetric monodal infinity category is a co-cartesian vibration. So this is the generalization of M1. Um, such that you have the equivalence. So this is exactly M2, the single condition. Okay, and I have some homework for you um, during the break or after, after the talk today. 
Number one, is the identity map a symmetric monoidal infinity category or not? It's a good exercise for practicing the definition and what co-cartesian vibration is. Number two, um, there is a functor from delta up to fin star. Well, this map is, I think it's like everywhere, but it took me some time to actually understand it. It's in a paper by Siegel called Categories and Cohomology Theories. And see, there he introduced gamma spaces, which has become obsolete now. But all the idea in the infinity category and um, in this story actually originate from his idea. So what is this functor? Well, this is a morph, it sends M to M, and this is a morphism in delta op, uh, which I have drawn on the left. So a morphism in delta is an order preserving map from zero to, for example, three here to zero to six. And now I'm going to produce for you a map from bracket M to bracket N. Okay, what it does is that he sends this interval, this points to one, he sends this interval to three and nothing to two because one and two hits the same thing and he sends this to zero. Okay, it's a functor um, as I defined. Well, it needs some, you need some wisdom to come up with it, uh, but it's now, a standard thing. And in fact, if you think about this, this is a simplicial set. And it's actually the simplicial set S1. But it's irrelevant for today. Okay, so now the homework is is uh is the nerve of delta up to nerve of thin star a symmetric monoidal infinity category or not? Um well I'll tell you the answer. It is not. Um, but you have to think about why. And now the follow-up question is, is it an infinity operat, which I haven't explained, but um, this is going to be the homework question after I explained infinity operat. Okay, right. So that's for the symmetric monoidal category. And now I'm going to move to operat. Here, I start with operat in sets. So my data of an operat has for each n, a set O n with symmetric group action, and it has a unit. This is called a unit map. It's a point in O one. It's a unit in the sense that um, in algebras it parameterizes the identity map. And it has structure maps from O k cross O n one to O n k to O of n one plus n k, and it needs to be unital equivariance and associativity in the suitable sense. Okay, so basically, um, you can think about O one as something uh, O n one as something with n one input and one output, and n k input and one output, and now you are composing, this is an element in uh, O, okay. And you are composing to get an element with N1 plus N2 to NK input and one output. So if you draw out this picture, you see that this very much looks like the picture for multi-category. So the quick observation here is that an opera is actually a multi-category with a single object. So now the single object is um, denoted by a symbol. Now I'm using symbol star. And the multimorphisms from n, star, n objects to one object is just given by O n. And this includes the empty input, right? So now I have a multi-category and then I can form the, um, I can form, I can do the uh, category, you construct a category out of a multi-category construction and I will get a category over thin star, uh, O tensor. 
OK, so what are objects in this category? Um, objects. Just to be more explicit, objects are the sequence of the single object um, of n of them. And the morphisms are, well, first I need, well, let me call this n. First, I need a mapping based sets alpha. And then I need um, for each one, uh, for each j from one to n, an element xj in all of uh, the number of alpha inverse j. And let's look at some examples. The trivial operand. Um, now I'm giving you a sigma n space. Well, this is a point if n is one, and it is nothing empty if n is zero, uh, if n is not one. Okay. What is tri tensor? Well, we can look at this. Its objects are n and its morphisms. Uh, first, I need an alpha, and then I need to pick um, an element in O of alpha inverse of j, which is only non-empty if alpha inverse of j has order one. So my alpha has to be a permutation. And the Z E zero operand, it's star if n is zero or one, and it is empty otherwise. Okay, what is E zero tensor? Um, its objects are n, its morphisms are um, now similar as before. I need to look at those alpha such that alpha inverse of j um, has the cardinality so that all of it has is non-empty. So alpha inverse of j must be of order zero or one. So my alpha must be an injection. Um, and it's based also. Commutativity operand is the operand that is a point for all n. What is com tensor? Um, its objects are n. Its morphisms are now um, all base maps. So basically, Com tensor is equal to fin star in this notation. Okay, associativity operand. It's sigma n and n. And uh, I'm not going to describe this, but it's this. There is a way to describe it. Okay, so now from an operand, uh, we can define its algebras. Basically, its algebra is those objects in C with these kind of structure maps satisfying um, unidal and associativity diagrams. So from this data, you see that ON, the set ON, parameterizes annary operations on A. And the advantage of um, describing algebra using operand is that if we allow this OM 
to be spaces, then we can parameterize unique canary operations up to contractable choices. Right. So the algebra of TRIV here are just everything. So there's no data. Algebra of E0 are based objects. And algebra um, of COM are commutative monoids. Because COM N basically tells us that there is a unique multiplication of anary, um, anary order. So there is a multiplication on your algebra and it is commutative because x, y is y, x. So it's commutative monoids. And algebra over the associativity operator are associative, which is required for a monoid. And uh, right, so here is a remark. Um, we have seen the need for coherent data already in the definition of a symmetry monoidal category. Basically, these structure maps look like, um, they look like C to the zero to C to the one and C to the two to C to the one with some possible op uh, operates parameterizing. So it seems to be the case that C is some sort of algebra in the category of categories with Cartesian product and uh, single category, single object category. Um, but it is not a commutative algebra because um, although we have I and tensor, but we also have coherence data. And in a symmetric monoidal infinity category, even more coherence data is introduced. So here is a picture where uh, going down the table, you have strictness in decreasing and coherence data increasing. So a symmetric monoidal category is less than a commutative algebra because you have coherence data, but it is not the extreme of an E-infinity algebra because um, you still have isomorphisms uh, the alpha, beta, and gamma, and you have a, um, you have some diagrams which are not um, well. Let me not say it. Um, I'm not sure what the precise statement I'm making here. Okay, and as a fact, um, which I haven't introduced yet. Commutative algebras, there is a way to relate these two things in the table. So symmetric monoidal infinity categories are equivalent to commutative algebra objects in um, category, the infinity category of the infinity categories with the Cartesian monoidal structure. So I haven't explained this yet, but um, this commutative algebra in symmetric monoidal category is is this thing, and it's actually, these two are the same uh, equivalent notions. And monoidal infinity categories are algebra objects in cat infinity with the Cartesian monoidal structure. Okay, and here are some more homework questions. Uh, if you have a symmetric monoidal category, this is a one category, can you find out all the P co-Cartesian edges in this construction P? And if O is an operand, can you find out all the P co-Cartesian edges uh, for this construction? Okay, it's a good practice. All right, so now uh, with the operands and the infinity symmetric monoidal category, sorry, symmetric monoidal infinity categories explained, I'm going to go to infinity operands, which generalizes both. And recall that, um, this was our definition of a symmetric monoidal infinity category. We have co-Cartesian condition and we have Siegel condition. Okay, now I'm going to give a definition. Alpha in fin star is called inert if, um, if for all i from one to n, the pre-image of alpha has one element. 
Um, so you can think of inert as um, as some kind of forgetting or forgetful. You forget some points and then map isomorphically. And examples include the row I defined before. These were the maps from n to one that sends I to one and all other points to zero. And it sort of gives you the coordinates. Okay, and an infinity operand is such a functor P to the nerve of thin star um, and the old tensor is an infinity category uh, such that there are three conditions. Number one, for all inert morphisms in thin star, there exist P co-cartesian lists of it. So basically this is relaxing the co-cartesian vibration condition um, because what a co-cartesian vibration is, is that any edge can be lifted to P co-cartesian edge. And here I'm only asking inert maps to be liftable. Oh, inert, spelled wrong. Okay, uh, second condition um, is new here. Second condition says that um, for all maps in thin star and objects over M, and objects over n, um, you choose first. You choose p co-cartesian lifts of rho i, um, starting from here c prime. So it's a rho i bar from c prime to c i prime, where c i prime is an object of O1 tensor. Okay. So after this choice, um, we consider the mapping space from c to c prime in O tensor over the component F um, and we compose with the rho i bar. So now we land in ci prime and it's the component over rho i composed with F. And we ask that this mapping space is a homotopy equivalence. Okay, we will see this condition in an example. Number three says that if I have n tuples of objects in O1 tensor, um, then I want the previous number two map to be able to hit this object. So there exists an object C in ON tensor and P co-cartesian morphisms. So these are the rho i bars. covering the row i from n to 1. So I want the tuple c1 comma dot 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 comma cn to be covered, uh, to be hit by the image of row n bar to row n bar. Okay, and here is a different condition three prime, which says row i shrink induces an equivalence um, O tensor n to O1 to the n times. And this is uh, this is an equivalence. So this condition implies three. Uh, it's a strengthening of three. And I claim that, and this is the Siegel condition. And the claim is that if we have one, two, three, uh, then if you have one, two, then three and three prime are actually equivalent. Um, number one basically says this phi is well-defined. You can, you have the row i lower shift. Number two says that phi is fully faithful. And number three says that phi is essentially subjective. Uh, I see a chat reference. Yes, uh, the reference, uh, when I have HA is short for higher algebra, and the numbers are the number for the results in higher algebra. I don't see it now. Okay. Uh, yeah, so now we sort of understood um, 
number one being a relaxation of the co-cartesian vibration and number three being the Siegel condition um, we can replace three by three prime and it's the three Siegel condition okay then what does number two say here um let's verify it in an example and we will see its content so I start with an ordinary operator and before we constructed this old tensor over thin star, and we can take its nerves and we will get an infinity operator. So it should satisfy one, two, three. And let's see two. So now I'm fixing an F from four to two as before, uh, sorry, as listed here, zero, one, two, zero, two, two, one, and three, four, two, two. Okay, so this is the F in condition number two the F. Okay, and O tensor is from, uh, it's from an operand. So O tensor over M has a single object for each M. So C and C prime, there's no choice. And now um, we want to choose P co-cartesian lifts, rho I bar, and then we want to verify that this mapping space induced by rho I bar is a homotopy equivalence. Okay, so let's first see what is a map from four to two over four is the um, unique element. In, in O tensor four and two is the unique element in O tensor two. Okay, over F, what is it? Well, the morphism we said it has an alpha from M to N and then it has elements in the operand. Now F is fixed, F is the alpha. And we look at the pre-image of this, one has a single pre-image, two has um, two pre-images. So this mapping space is O1 cross O2, a mapping set uh, in this case. Okay, now we are composing with rho i bar to map over O tensor of rho i uh, of four to one. Okay, so um, I can pick rho i bar to be um, to be this unit element in O one. Yeah, before I do that, let's see what is this rho i composed with f. Rho i composed with f. So you compose with rho i here to one. If i is one, then we just project two to one and then everything else to zero. So when i is one, this mapping space is O1. And when i is two, we project two to one, so three and four are sent to one. So this is O2, there are two elements. Okay, and each row I um, from M to one sends I to one and everything else to zero. So um, the space we are choosing rho i bar from is actually just O1. Okay, and now I'm picking the element unit eta, which is a specified object in operand. I'm picking that element. So this is what I mean by picking rho i bar to be eta. And I claim that eta is a co-cartesian edge. Uh, why is that? Well, let's check. Um, now I'm having the eta covering the rho i, and now I have my data beta and g, and I want to fill in, fill in this arrow, dotted arrow. So this is in O tensor, this is in thin star. Okay, so there are two cases for beta. If beta 
um, beta is a base map. So beta of one, uh, if it's zero, then, then it's sort of trivial and beta composed with rho i is sending everything to zero. So it's easy to check in this case. And let's skip it. And without loss of generality, we can assume beta is injective. Okay, then beta is going to be, uh, then rho g, which is beta composed with rho i is going to be some rho j. So the element G is some rho J, so it corresponds just like what we described before, it corresponds to some element in O1. And beta also corresponds to some element uh, sorry, beta is in fin star, so it doesn't correspond to anything. Um, H that we want to lift or we want to come up with corresponds to some element in O1. And what we want is that um, H composed with eta, well, this element Y, Y composed multiplied to eta is equal to, to the element G. And eta is a unit. So O1 actually in an operand is a monoid and eta is the identity in the monoid. So we can take y to be x and it's unique. So I've proved that eta is a chosen as the rho i bar is a co-cartesian edge. Okay, and with this cho chosen rho i bar, my map here is going to be projection to the corresponding component. So it's a, a actually an equal, uh, equal as spaces rather than just being a homotopy equivalence. Okay, so this long argument shows that the construction from an ordinary operand to N to ten, O tensor satisfies condition two of an infinity operand. And from this example, um, we see that these rho i bars are projection to the o, to the uh, opera spaces. So two is basically saying that morphisms in O tensor are all made up by morphisms um, over over n i over n to one, which, if you really have a classical opera, are just the set O n. Okay, and there are two examples. Uh, number one, the identity map is an infinity operand. Number two, if you have a symmetric monoidal infinity category, then it is an infinity operand. Okay. All right, and I think that's all for my first talk. And thanks for your attention.